You're watching NASA TV. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us remotely. I'm Chelsea Bayarte here at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. The crew in orbit is getting ready for a spacewalk scheduled for tomorrow, Tuesday, November 30th, where astronauts Tom Marshburn and Kayla Barron will suit up and go outside of the International Space Station to replace a faulty communications antenna system with a spare that's already attached to the outside of the station. This will be the first spacewalk of Expedition 66 and Kayla Barron's first spacewalk of her career. Here to talk more about that are our briefers. We're joined by Dana Weigel, Deputy Manager for the International Space Station Program, Flight Director Vincent LaCourt, and Art Thomason, our Spacewalk Officer for tomorrow's EVA. The briefers joining us from separate rooms will kick us off with an overview of tomorrow's plans, and then we'll open the forum up to questions on our phone bridge, questions submitted on social media using hashtag AskNASA as well. For those joining us on the phone, please press star one to add your name to the queue. Dana, do you want to kick us off with some opening remarks? Sure, thank you. Let's see, it's a busy time as always for us on board Space Station. We've got seven crew members on board, four from NASA, one from ESA, and two Russian cosmonauts. Just a few weeks ago, we returned Crew 2 back home after about 200 days on orbit. Two days after that, we launched Crew 3, so for us that was an indirect uh, crew handover which is uh, pretty easy since we had Mark Vandehei on board. At a little over a week ago on Saturday, November 20th, we released the Cygnus NG-16 vehicle. That brought with it 8,200 pounds of cargo. And uh, along with that was the solar ray modification kit, which we installed on our last US spacewalk. Um, it also brought an interesting new carbon dioxide removal technology called the four bed CO2 scrubber. We've had that up and running, and that's uh, been doing a fantastic job on board removing the CO2. Last week, uh, the Russians launched a new module called the Node, and they docked that to the MLM. And of course, the MLM is a new addition to the, the Russian segment as of this summer. In between that launch and docking, they undocked the 78 Progress, which freed up the port for the uh, Node docking. In a little over a week, they'll launch the 66S Soyuz. That'll be a short mission. It's bringing up two Japanese tourists and a Russian cosmonaut. And then two weeks after that, on December 21st, we'll launch our SpaceX 24 cargo vehicle, followed shortly after that by the Russian departure of the POW. The POW is the propulsion bus that they used last week to bring the node up. Uh, tomorrow's spacewalk has uh, primarily focused on replacing the failed String 2 S-band antenna subassembly, or SASA, that's located on the P1 truss. Um, this one's got a failed return link, which means we can uplink from the ground to station through that string, but we can't get anything um, back through its downlink. Uh, it hasn't been an impact to us for operations because we've got a lot of redundancy on board. We've got another S-band string called String 1 that's fully functional and healthy, and we also have uplink and downlink capability through our KU band system. As uh, mentioned previously, the EVA will be conducted by Tom Marshburn and Kayla Barron. It's exciting to look back on what we've accomplished this last year and what we have planned in front of us. We just surpassed 21 years of human presence on board the space station, and we look forward to working with our partners for many more successful years to come. With that, I'll hand it over to our lead flight director for the spacewalk, Vincent LaCourt. Thanks, Dana. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the preparation for the spacewalk, and then I'll hand it to Art to talk more details about the spacewalk. Uh, we found out we had a degraded S-band assembly in mid-September. Uh, that timing allowed us to have Tom and Kayla go into our neutral buoyancy laboratory, our big pool where we practice spacewalks, and practice our exact spacewalk that we'll be executing tomorrow. So that's a great advantage uh, to give them that practice uh, for success tomorrow. Once they got on board, we were able to do what we call the onboard uh, verification fit check, where the crew completely dons a spacesuit on the inside of the space station and floats around and, and makes sure that it fits properly and that they're very comfortable in the suit, and that worked great. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, suit checkouts. Everything's worked out well. The crew has spent time configuring their tools for the spacewalk, as well as studying procedures. 
Uh, we had a conference with them this morning. The crew's feeling great. Uh, they feel very well prepared, and my ground team is also well prepared. So we're ready for tomorrow. So now I'll go ahead and hand over to Art, and he'll walk you through details of our spacewalk. Thanks, Vincent. Hi, my name is Art Thomason. I'm the EVA officer for US EVA 78. As mentioned earlier, about two months ago, during a routine checkout, it was determined that the port S-band antenna had a failed return link. Uh, during that time, we also quickly realized that um, there was a high beta period coming up in early December. So we wanted to get that unit changed out before then because the starboard S-band antenna could potentially reach operational thermal limits during that time. Uh, so since learning of this failure, my team has been working hard to develop a plan and procedures uh, to replace the degraded uh, port S-band antenna. So I'd like to recognize Greer Wilt, Michael Dino, Tanner Burns, and Stephen Villano for all the hard work they've put in to get us up to this point. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, you know, the plan is to change out the degraded S-band antenna on P1. We're going to replace that with a spare unit on Express Logistics Carrier number three. Uh, so this slide is going to show you a little more details about what we plan on doing. If you look in the middle of the screen, you can see the degraded unit. This is the P1 or port S-band antenna. And then on the right-hand side of the graphic, we have the spare unit that's on Express Logistics Carrier number three. You can also see a red line and a blue line. That red line represents the translation path for Tom Marshburn. He's going to head out of the airlock and start setting up the robotic arm. He's going to be on the robotic arm for uh, the majority of the EVA, and it's going to take him back and forth between the two work sites as they perform the swap. Uh, Kayla Barron's translation path is represented by the blue line. Uh, she'll translate from the airlock past the degraded unit and all the way out to Express Logistics Carrier 3, where she'll begin preparing the spare unit. So she'll also be going back and forth throughout the day uh, to facilitate the swap of both units. Uh, my next slide, slide 6, yeah, should show a hardware overview of the S-band antenna. So starting at the top, we see the high gain antenna. And then a little bit below that is the low gain antenna. Um, this is responsible for the communication with satellites. Uh, the high gain antenna can point to satellites uh, to, to get better coverage. And then you can see kind of between the high gain and low gain antenna are gimbal bolts. So these gimbal bolts are put in place during the EVA to protect the unit as we're translating with it back and forth between the P1 truss and Express Logistics carrier number three. Uh, moving down in this picture, you can see four launch bolts and two mass bolts. These bolts are used to connect the S-band antenna to Express Logistics Carrier number three. Um, they were there for the, the launch of the unit. And then going down further, we see uh, some electrical connectors. There's three connectors. There's one that provides heater power, one that provides operational power, and the other is for data. And then at the very bottom, we have a stanchion bolt. This is what makes the physical connection between the antenna stanchion and the truss structure. Over on the right-hand side, you can see that there are a few handrails that the crew will use to maneuver the unit as they translate back and forth between uh, P1 and Express Logistics Carrier 3. I think that's it for the slides that I have, but I do have a video that's going to give you a few more details about the EVA, so I'd like to roll that now. For US EVA 78, both crew members will be working together to replace a failed S-band antenna. EV1 will be Tom Marshburn wearing the suit with the red stripes. EV2 will be Kayla Barron wearing the suit with the white stripes. EV1 will lead out by going up to Cedar Spur and translating on to face one. There he will begin setting up the robotic arm. EV2 will follow the same path initially, translate up to face one, and then continue Zenith past the failed S-band antenna and out to Express Logistics Carrier number three. Once at the work site, EV2 will stow two bags and then retrieve a rigidizable tether. This tether will be installed on the forward face of the logistics carrier and will be used to temporarily stow the degraded antenna 
as it's brought over to the carrier later in the EVA. EV1 will set up the robotic arm by installing a portable foot restraint, and then we'll ingress that foot restraint and get ready for arm motion. EV2 will continue some prep work at the express logistics carrier, and then we'll translate to the degraded SASA or S-band antenna. EV1 will then provide guidance to the robotic arm to get him to his next work site, while EV2 will release three connectors that provide heater power, functional power, and data. EV1 will put gimbal locks in place. These will prevent the antenna from moving as it's translated back and forth from P1 over to the express logistics carrier. These four bolts will then be driven by the pistol grip tool. EV1 will then have the robotic arm rotate him around to the handrail side of the S-band antenna while EV2 releases the stanchion bolt that secures the antenna to structure. Once that bolt is released, the crew will work together to free the antenna, and EV1 will translate on the robotic arm to express logistics carrier number three. Both crew members will work together to temporarily stow this S-band antenna in that rigidizable tether. They'll then begin to prepare the spare so that it can be brought over to P1. They'll remove a thermal blanket, stow that out of the way. This provides thermal conditioning for the unit. They each have two bolts each to release and they'll be using a special tool called a right angle drive in order to gain access to those bolts. EV2 will then get into position to drive the two remaining bolts. pistol grip tool will be used for that as well. These are called the mast bolts. There's a soft dock to overcome. Uh, once that is overcome, EV1 will gain control of the spare unit and then we'll ride the arm over to the P1 worksite. Once at the P1 worksite, both crew members will work together to soft dock this or it will be temporarily held into the truss while ED2 drives the stanchion bolt that will secure it in place. ED2 will then reconnect the three connectors that provide heater power, functional power, and data. ED1 will release the four gimbal locks. At this point, the antenna will be free to track satellites to allow good communication between the space station and the ground. Once the crew is clear of the worksite, they'll perform a checkout on this antenna. Both crew members will then head back to Express Logistics Carrier Number 3. At this point, they'll be working together to stow the degraded unit back onto the flight releasable attach mechanism, or FRAM. This is the way that these ORUs, or orbital replacement units, are brought onto the space station. This one has heater power that helps to keep it alive. EV2 will drive two bolts to secure it to structure. These are called the mast bolts. Once those bolts are driven, the final step will be to install a thermal blanket that provides thermal conditioning and keeps this degraded unit available as a spare if it's ever needed. EV1 will then back away from the worksite on the robotic arm and head back towards the truss. will then gather the bags and tools at the work site and stow those on her body restraint tether. She'll head back to the airlock, 
you can stow those bags. Meanwhile, EV-1 will be getting off of the robotic arm He'll remove the portable foot restraint and he'll return it to the starboard seat of cart. This is where he picked it up at the beginning of the EVA. EV-1 will then head back to the airlock as well. They'll both ingress. This will conclude US EBA 78. Okay, well, as you saw in the video, there's a single bolt that holds the P1 S band antenna to the truss. But uh, in order to help with alignment of that bolt, there's something called a soft dock feature that holds it into place. So on the stanchion portion of the antenna, um, this, is, this is what it would look like. There's an alignment pin that, that you can see right here. And then there's also two spring plungers. You can see one in the kind of the top and bottom of the screen. Uh, so these help hold it into the soft dock feature. On the truss itself, there's a, a ramp surface on this receptacle, and then there's a lip here that the spring plungers will engage into. And then you'll also see that there's a receptacle for the alignment pin. So as you bring these together, uh, the crew will need to make sure that they have they have proper alignment uh, because they're going to want these spring plungers to ride over this ride over this. Um, this canted surface and fall underneath this lip. So as they bring it into place, you'll be able to, to feel it and then they'll need to wiggle it a little bit in order to get those to engage. And then once they're fully engaged, it'll pop into place and then the, the bolt will be aligned so they can continue to drive the bolt and ensure that it's aligned well. Um, it is a little tricky to get off at times. It's something that we've seen on previous spacewalks when we've dealt with uh, these S-band antennas. So the crew is well prepared to handle that if we need to. So I think that was all that I had, but uh, there's been a lot of work that's, uh, that's happened on the ground and on orbit. The crew has done a great job preparing for this. So uh, we are ready to go for tomorrow's spacewalk. And with that, I will turn it back over to Chelsea. Thanks, Art. Can't wait to see it in action. And thank you to all of our briefers. We're now going to start taking some questions on our phone bridge. If you're dialed in and would like to speak your question, please press star 1 to virtually raise your hand and enter the queue. And star 2 if you'd like to lower your hand if your question already got asked. We'll also be taking questions on social media using hashtag AskNASA. And if possible, on the phone bridge, if you could um, say who your question is for. So, to kick us off on our phone bridge, let's go to Mark Caro, Aviation Week. Um, I'm not sure who might best answer this question, or it might be a couple, but how did you assess uh, whether there's a debris threat from the uh, anti-satellite test that occurred earlier this month, and um, and how did, if you did do that, how how did you come up with uh, with the decision to proceed? Thank you. See, I, I can take that one. Um, great question. Um, obviously, uh, that the incident on uh, the 14th of November, it was late in the evening, um, was a concern for us. Um, when the initial breakup occurred, the debris was very concentrated. Um, over time, it is dispersed, but initially it was very concentrated. And as ISS passed through the orbit of the debris, we had a heightened um, elevated concern for about 24 hours after the event. Um, in fact, we had the crew take a number of different actions on board, and including going to their safe haven, their, their uh, crew return vehicles for uh, two of the passes. Um, since that time, the debris has dispersed out quite a bit more. Um, the background environment is slightly elevated. It's about two times what it had been prior to the event for a uh, space station as a whole. Uh, because the EMU, though, is so much more vulnerable to smaller pieces, and there are so many more smaller pieces of debris, mostly contributed by um, micrometeoroids and naturally occurring events, um, the change to the EMU risk itself was much smaller. It was on the order of about 7%. And so we run, um, we run, run different models and, and predictions to understand what our environment is. Of course, most of these pieces that we're talking about with the suit are much smaller than what we could track. So that's done through just modeling and, and understanding of the environment from experiments and, and from previous um, knowledge. So this particular EVA, um, its MMOD risk falls within the family of what we've had for EVAs over the last few years. 
Thank you, Dana. We'll take our next question from Will Robinson Smith, Spectrum News 13. Yeah, thanks for uh, doing this and taking our questions. Um, I suppose my question would also be for Dana. Uh, you mentioned that uh, just coming up in, in, in about a week or so, the ISS will welcome a couple of uh, tourists to the station. And so wanted to see with uh, this also on the docket how Crew 3 is preparing for um, visitors aboard the space station and if there are any planned interactions between uh, the Japanese guests and uh, Crew 3 astronauts. Thanks. So this mission is very similar to other spaceflight participant missions where there's very little um, activity planned on the, the U.S. segment. Um, in this case, for the upcoming mission, there's just a short period of time where we'll be visiting our cupola. Of course, that's a, a great place to get wonderful Earth views and, and to spend some time doing tourism activities. And so that's really the only planned activity. Of course, the crew on board is free to an, invite uh, other crew members over to their segment as they choose. Um, the crew also has some limited access to our um, onboard internet. And so they've got some short periods of time where they'll be borrowing a laptop. Thank you. And we'll take our next question from Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Uh, yes, hi. Um, probably for Dana as well. Will the two spacewalkers be taking any special precautions or doing anything out of the ordinary given this 7% increase in debris field out there that could uh, damage their suits? And, it, at, you know, the space station at large, are there, is there anything uh, being done with the position of the station or anything um, along those same lines for the same reason? Thanks. Um. You know, unfortunately, when you have a debris event like this and, and you get a lot of really small pieces scattered around, it just becomes part of the average environment. And so at some point, there's not a specific directional aspect to the debris. So there's nothing different that they will do out on the spacewalk. We did have a lot of discussions about uh, the tasks and what tasks um, we wanted to do. Um, we've got a couple get-aheads that, that we will do, but there's some that we actually took off the list. Um, now that we understand the environment, what it really tells us is EVA has always been risky. And so though the 7% is a, a small increase, that is well within the flux that we see in the natural environment. So it's, it's not elevated over what we've seen. We've had EVAs in the past with even higher MMOD risk. For space station as a whole, there are about 1,700 new objects, larger objects that are being tracked. It will take a few months to get all of those cataloged and into our normal uh, debris tracking process where we can then assess um, missed distances or how close these items get to ISS. Those are our standard kind of conjunction assessments. And so that's still work in front of us as those items get cataloged. Thank you. Our next question will go to Marcia Smith with spacepolicyonline.com. Thanks so much, and I'm not sure who this is for. I'm actually curious about the robotic arm that ESA has on the Nauka module. Is, is that something that can be used for work on the U.S. OS, or can that only reach areas on the Russian side? Um, I can start with that, and if Vincent has anything to add, he's free to add to it. That's, it's really designed for use on the uh, Russian segment, so all the planned activities and interfaces are compatible with um, the Russian segment, so we don't have any planned use or operations for it. And Vincent, did you have anything to add? Nope, nothing to add, just as you saw in the you know, the, the graphics from ART, all the work we're doing is on the on the P1 truss uh, where um, we'll use the U.S., uh, sorry, Canadian robotic arm for that. Great, thank you. And speaking of robotic arms, we actually have a question from social media um, for ART or Vincent uh, from Kate on Twitter wants to know who will be operating the robotic arm during tomorrow's EVA. So Go I can- forward, Vincent. Yeah, I can go ahead and answer that. So we have Matthias will be what we call M1. So he's the primary robotics operator. And then Raja will be what we call the M2. So kind of looking over his shoulder and doing some of the communications with the EV crew and the ground. So it'll be all the um, onboard robotic operators for tomorrow. Great, thank you. Our next question will be back on the phone bridge. We've got Bill Harwood from CBS News. Yeah, hey, thank you. Um, I think this is for Dana. 
Um, and, and I'm really not asking this because of the ASAT test, but but the whole thing's made me re-ask a question I wondered about. What what does the seven percent refer to? I mean, does that mean there's a seven percent higher chance of a puncture? Is it a seven percent higher chance of uh, any kind of impact? I mean, what what do those numbers actually mean? Is what I'm wondering about in terms of MMOD risk to an EVA. Um, it, it does mean penetration, but it doesn't mean it's a catastrophic penetration. And so when we talk about risk numbers, both to ISS or to the suit, we talk about a, a particle size that could uh, penetrate the, the structure. For the suit itself, there's a certain size of penetration that uh, is supportable. There's an emergency oxygen package on the suit that would feed it for a while. Um, so it covers that range and, of course, larger items also. Um, just to give you a, a feel for it, when we talk about EVA risk, it's generally around uh, 1 in 2,700. So that's considered the, the risk of having some size of a penetration over the course, over the duration of the six-and-a-half-hour EVA. 2,700 EVAs you would get hit once. Is that what one in 2,700 means? That's that's basically how you could think about it. Okay, thanks. Thank you, and as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question during the Q&A portion of the briefing, please press star one to be added to the queue, or you can submit your question on social media using hashtag AskNASA. We've got another question on our phone bridge here from Chelsea Goad from space.com. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my question is for Dana. You mentioned that um, while there is you know, only the 7% increase, there were some get-ahead activities that were taken off the list, list for the spacewalk tomorrow. Um, could you go into detail about what get-ahead activities were taken off of the schedule? And if you could confirm that it, were these taken off the schedule because of the additional debris, debris uh, created by the Russian ASAT test the other week? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer it in terms of the philosophy that we used, and then I'll let either Art or Vincent fill in some of the other details. Um, some of the get-aheads that we do in particular for this EVA that we thought were important to leave on the list are those items that um, enable us to use future robotic capability to replace uh, failed boxes. Uh, so one of the ones that we are going to do is um, some bolts on what we call a, a battery charge discharge unit. If we spend the EVA time tomorrow while we're in the vicinity to remove these bolts, then in the future, if that box fails, we don't have to go out and do a spacewalk. We can uh, do a robotic replacement of it. So that is a um, risk buy-down for the future in terms of not having to do a spacewalk to respond to that. So just at a philosophical level, those are the types of things that we left um, on the table. And then there's a, a few other things that we ended up taking off. We had to make a decision um, pretty early on uh, in terms of what we were going to ask the crew to study and prepare to do. And so before we really had an understanding of the debris environment, we wanted to be conservative. Um, so of course that was factored in and then the other item I mentioned about 1,700 other objects, though they're not just a specific risk to the, the EVA, because we aren't tracking those yet and because we can't do our normal conjunction assessments, they do pose some elevated risk to ISS, increased uncertainty, and so we didn't want to leave uh, the crew out longer for, for items that we didn't consider critical. We'll take another question on our phone bridge, this time from uh, Joey Roulette from the New York Times. Hey, uh, my question was already asked, but I, I guess to follow up on that last one, um, what specific tasks did you take off the list um, as a result of, you know, the increased risk from the uh, ASAT test debris? Uh, and I guess, was it a direct result from that debris or were there maybe other reasons? Thanks. As far as uh, what we took off the list, there's two major ones. Uh, one is what we have called a CP8 cable routing. So this is an Ethernet cable that runs out to the port Zenith camera. Uh, so this will make it a Wi-Fi hotspot in the future. We do have this timeline on a future EVA, so there really wasn't a, a, a big driver to do this as a get ahead. So we, we do have a, a plan to, to get that one done. Uh, we also have one that's releasing bolts on a spare nitrogen tank. This is something that would save time on a future EVA should we ever have to replace this tank. But again, it wasn't a, a critical task. So there are all things along those lines. We do expect the, the, 
the S band uh, replacement to take the majority of the EVA. So we're not expecting to have a lot of get ahead time, but we still have a few things uh, on the table just in case uh, we have some extra time. And, and I'll just add to that that, um, again, because we had to make the decision about the content of the EVA a couple of weeks ago and we didn't have all of the assessment data in, and so we didn't understand yet what the debris environment risk increase was, we were conservative in eliminating things from the uh, spacewalk. The uh, 7 percent in and of itself is not a large increase, and that's well within what we see with normal atmospheric fluctuations and the normal amount of debris that kind of uh, moves through. So that wasn't the specific uh, reason. It wasn't tied to the 7 percent. It was just tied to trying to be conservative until we really understood our new environment. Our next question comes from social media. Uh, Dana, we have a question for you kind of on the history of the S-band antenna. It's from Ben Evans on Twitter who wants to know kind of generally how long has the failed S-band antenna been on the ISS? Has it ever experienced problems before? When did the replacement arrive? Anything you can give us about that? Um, it's been operating for a long time. I would have to get the specific dates for you, but um, it's been pretty pretty steady and doing well into this last checkout. But let me pass it to either Art or Vincent to see if they happen to remember the uh, the dates. Yep, it actually flew almost 21 years ago, so it's actually been working for a really long time. And the spare flew in 2010, so it's 11 years old, hasn't been used yet. It's been out there on the, the express uh, logistics care, just waiting for this case to, to be used. So again, the, the person who designed our S-band antenna did a great job. It's really lasted a long time. Thank you. We have another question from Marcia Smith from Space Policy Online. Uh, thanks so much. I was wondering if Dana could provide an update on the status of the discussions with Russia. I know that uh, several NASA people were over there, and they were talking about crew exchange, I gather, but uh, also Rogozin has put out a statement saying he's talking with NASA about possibly using the ports on Prichal. So could you just give us an update of where things stand now that I assume everybody's back? Yeah, sure. Um, we've had a lot of good discussions with our Russian colleagues about doing a crew exchange. I think, as you know, it's always been our goal to uh, fly astronauts and cosmonauts on both vehicles, both the Soyuz and our crewed vehicles. And so those discussions are, are moving along very well. We are targeting next fall to start that exchange. So the hope and the goal that we're both working towards is to try to fly a cosmonaut on, a, on our fifth SpaceX vehicle, USCV-5 and then to fly one of our astronauts on the Soyuz. So those discussions are still progressing and, and going very well. Um, the, the new node, I think, was your other question. Um, the Russians do have plans for using that node for all of the alternate docking ports. It's uh, not unlike our node. Of course, our node is, is bundled already with permanent modules attached to it. But in this case, they've got multiple different um, docking ports that they can use for uh, future visiting vehicles. Rosen and said something that uh, they were talking with NASA about docking Crew Dragon there, possibly? Um, we haven't had specific discussions about that. The, the docking interfaces between the two vehicles are quite different. There's a probe and cone style docking system that the Russians use, and, and ours is um, a very different interface. So today, those are not compatible interfaces. Something on the talks about the crew exchange. What is it that turns a hope and a goal into a signed deal? Who is it that has to finally sign that on both sides? Um, we will sign, we, our initial agreement for the details of that will be assigned at the, the program level. And of course, there's a lot of details, as you can imagine, when crew members start training in each other's countries, et cetera. So there are a lot of drafts in work, and so hopefully we'll get something signed very shortly. Thank you, Dana. And thank you to all of those who submitted their questions on social media and here on our phone bridge today. And thank you to our briefers for joining us and making us all a little smarter about our EVA and a little more excited for tomorrow's spacewalk. NASA TV coverage will begin at 5.30 a.m. Eastern Time for the spacewalk that's scheduled to begin around 7.10 a.m. and will conclude about six and a half hours later. Thanks again for joining us.